Good evening and welcome to Virtual CAM. My name is Taylor Renee Aldridge. I am the Visual Arts Curator and Program Manager at CAM. And I'm excited to introduce tonight's program, Black Pentecostalism and the Azusa Street Revival, moderated by my brilliant colleague and CAM historian curator, Susan Anderson, with panelists, Professor Gaston Espinoza and Professor Marnie Campbell. An ecstatic interracial religious movement erupted in Los Angeles in 1906, led by charismatic black preacher, Reverend William Seymour, and known as the Azusa Street Revival. The movement is considered the origin of, of global black Pentecostalism. Tonight, panelists will discuss how California became home to a movement that defied social, racial and religious conviction, convention and sparked a worldwide denomination. The panelists included in tonight's conversation are Professor Gaston Espinoza and Professor Marnie Campbell. Gast Gaston Espinoza is the author, V. Stoughton Professor of Religious Studies at Claremont McKenna College and was the 2016-2017 William Simone Fellow in Religion and Public Life in the Department of Politics at Princeton University. He is the author and editor of eight books, including William J. Seymour in the Origin Origins of Global Pentecostalism, Latino Pentecostals in America, Faith and Politics and Action, which was published with Harvard Press, Religion, Race, and Barack Obama's New Democratic Pluralism, Mexican American Religions, Spirituality, Activism, and Culture, which was with Duke Press. And lastly, the US Latino Religions and Civic Activism in the United States with Oxford Press. Marnie L. Campbell is an Associate Professor at Loyola Marymount University and the Chair of the Department of African American Studies. She received her PhD in History at UCLA in 2006 and holds a master's degree in African-American studies. Her book, Making Black Los Angeles, explores the intersections of race, class, and gender in early Los Angeles and will be published in fall, or has been published in fall of 2016 by the University of North Carolina Press. Her study emphasizes issues of labor, politics, and culture through the intersection of this diverse community with other communities of color she has completed an extensive database of almost every African-American family in Los Angeles from 1950 to 1910. Super excited to have these brilliant minds with us today. Um, and the panel uh, today is presented in conjunction with my exhibition at CAM entitled Enunciated Life. The show, which is now on view, examines Black spiritual beliefs, as well as the movement, sounds, and other bodily expressions that have been engendered, that have engendered communication within and beyond Black churches. And it also explores how they operate as a point of departure for considering modes of surrender. Before I hand it over to the panel, I would just like to share a brief section of an essay that was published yesterday um, with the LA Review of Books that discusses my first encounter with incarnation, spiritual incarnation as a child. Um, I write in the essay that um, recalling the experience of uh, one of my first church experiences that at the morning, in the morning at the Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church in Detroit was the first time I committed myself to a public testimony, to a public claiming of spirit and faith. It was the first time I'd see a person sanctified or possessed by the Holy Spirit. Indeed, over several years during my engagement with the church, I would experience a litany of rituals that reminded us that we exist, rituals that remind us to continue doing so. The corporal movements, the sounds, the feeling, the tableau of such rituals all remain indelible on my mind. Liturgical dancers dressed in white representing scripture and gospel through animated gestures, women in large brim hats and shiny skirt suits who capitulated with force, collapsing their necks, heads and backs, people falling out as if everything else around them didn't matter, as if they were suspended between two states. Other women who ran to provide tissue and fans for the falling, a preacher conceding to an omnipresent spirit while consoling the congregants possessed bodies from the podium. 
witnessing the way that my fellow congregates, congregants gave up their bodies to the Holy Spirit manifested an unrelenting curiosity within me. How could you commit to a fall without knowing if someone would catch you? What are the feelings in that moment of collapse? Where do they go? What comes to them? From the outside looking in and even on the edge of this witnessing, I have felt the hum, where I have felt the hum of the spirit circling my own body. This was the closest thing to freedom I had ever felt. With all of that said, I pass, over, pass it over to my colleague, Susan Anderson, to moderate. And thank you all for joining us in virtual cam. Thank you so much, Taylor. I wanna welcome everybody this evening and tell you a little bit, give you our agenda for the evening. Um, also to, of course, let you know that you're gonna be a part of this. We're gonna be taking your questions at the end. So please feel free to uh, write in the Q&A section. Uh, tonight, we're gonna be talking about an, an historic event, the Azusa Street Revival. The original event I'd like to remind you occurred 115 years ago, April 8th in 1906 in downtown Los Angeles. So we're actually in the anniversary month for the Azusa Street Revival. And there is no better time to, for us to examine this history that is so critical to the history of our city and uh, to the spiritual history uh, of, of our country and actually around the globe. Uh, I want to emphasize that this program is being presented in association with the CAM exhibit that you just heard about from its curator, my wonderful colleague, Taylor Aldridge, Enunciated Life. Uh, we heard some of her personal testament. And I also wanna remind you that CAM is open and you can uh, come to CAM, reserve your free tickets and take a look at this exhibition and the others that are in our galleries. The Azusa Street Revival uh, represents a dramatic example of the coming together of the kind of intimate experience that Taylor talked about and that her uh, exhibition expresses a combination of that intimate experience and history making events on the street. What we're gonna do tonight, our agenda is first, we're going to have Professor Gaston Espinoza. He's gonna provide us with a kind of introduction. He's gonna give a visual sense through slides of some of the main actors and movers uh, who were responsible for this eruption, for this revival. And after Professor Espinoza's presentation, Professor Marnie Campbell and I are going to join him in a discussion about the Azusa Street Revival. So Professor Espinoza, are you ready? I am. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> well, it's great to be with you all. Thank you so much, Susan and Taylor, for your warm hospitality. It's a pleasure and an honor to join you this evening. I thought what I would do is just share with you a few photographs that capture a little bit of the spirit of Azusa Street and give, give you a sense for who was involved. This revival uh, ushered in a whole religious movement. In fact, one could say without exaggeration, it's one of the most important religious movements of the 20th century and even world history. Because today there are hundreds of millions of people around the world that trace their roots back to this Pentecostal revival in every part of the world. It crosses racial boundaries, linguistic boundaries, cultural boundaries. It permeates all facets of life in quiet little ways. Because most Pentecostals come from the working class background, they tend to be women, they tend to be racial ethnic minorities, people that live in the margins of society, but also in CEOs, also in, you know, in high tech businesses. So the movement itself is, is a, a movement that transcends boundaries, that transcends borders, and it has a very uh, set of humble roots, but, the, but the, the roots are part of what makes it so powerful. It was a little movement that began in an obscure section of California in the Black Temple 
district, as it was called in Los Angeles in 1906. Let me show you just a few pictures here. We're going to go to share screen of this revival, uh, in particular, the places where they met. So here we have a picture of William, William J. Seymour. He's probably about 35 or so in this picture, 35 to 40 years old, with a Bible in his hand. And there to the right is the Apostolic Faith Mission, or the Azusa Street Mission. And this is where the revival lasted for three years, from 1906 to 1909. According to reports, it, it, it uh, went every day for three years. They had three services a day, morning, noontime, and evening. And sometimes the services would blend into one another. This used to be the Stevens African Methodist Episcopal Church, which they used for a number of years. And they eventually moved into a new a new location, and this was used as, as a barn on the first floor and as apartments on the second floor. So the Stevens Methodist Episcopal Church, African Methodist Episcopal Church, rented it out to Seymour and their, their, their team of believers, and they turned it into a place where a revival erupted in 1906. So this is where they met. It's a place that's important because of its location. It's in the historic Black community in Los Angeles. And it's in a place of expectation because prior to the revival, there was a citywide prayer service for revival. People across denominations, across racial ethnic groups were praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit before Seymour even arrived in the city. And here we have a picture of William J. Seymour's uh, multi-ethnic um, Azusa Street Revival team. Notice it's made up of men and women. And this was the leadership team for William J. Seymour. He was uh, served alongside, people who served alongside of him was um, Hiram Smith to his left, who was a former Methodist pastor. And then you have various leaders all around him who came from different denominations to Los Angeles when they heard about the revival. The woman to the, to, to the uh, left of Seymour, um, African-American woman is Jenny Evans Moore, who he eventually married in 1908. And she became the, uh, a pastor there at the Azusa Street Revival. And she was an important leader because she was uh, one of the first people to be filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. And she also led the worship. The worship was first a cappella, and later they brought in instruments. So this is the, the, the team that Seymour led this revival. And here's a picture of one of the first Mexican-Americans to ever receive the, Pente the Pentecostal experience, Abundio L. Lopez. Here's a copy of his ordination certificate signed by William J. Seymour, dating from 1909. And the Pentecost movement, as you know, has exploded throughout Latin America. Today, there are tens of millions of Latin Americans and Latinos in the United States who practice Pentecostal charismatic movements. And they trace the roots all the way back to Seymour here in the revival. So with that, I'll go ahead and just uh, stop my comments for a few minutes and we'll open up to Marty Campbell and uh, Susan Anderson for additional comments. I don't know if I should start or if Susan should start. Um, yes, I'm here just to, you know, a little delay <laughs> um, we want uh, Gaston to join us too. Um, so come back on screen. Thank you. Uh, no, just just Zoom reality is what we're dealing with. And um, let's go back and we'll start with Marnie, Professor Campbell, and then go to Gaston, Professor Espinosa. Let's go back to that day. Mm -hmm. or, or that evening in Los Angeles, how did the Azusa Street Revival start? And then we're gonna move back into history uh, to the history that led up to the movement. But what was that day like and what led up to it? Sure. So um, first there was a question in the chat about whether there's any 
um, historical landmark or site. And so I, I did answer that um, to say that it's the, um, the Azusa Street revival, the big revival um, that Dr. Espinoza was talking about occurred um, in the area of downtown Los Angeles. That's the home now of the Japanese American Cultural Community Center. Um, so it's in downtown Los Angeles. But before that, um, the, the group started off as like a small prayer group. Mostly it was, you know, there, there's some history that we'll get into, but mostly it was Seymour and um, some, some Black women who, who did laundry and things like that, who supported him. A few people from um, some churches that brought him out here. And he was staying in the home. He was staying in someone's home who had um, who had asked um, who was sick and had asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit and pray that he could speak in tongues. And 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 um, Seymour certainly prayed with him. But it was at a Bible study that Jenny Evans Moore. Um, received the Holy Spirit as well and and began to um, pray and sing in other tongues as Dr. Espinoza mentioned and pointed her out um, and she later became Seymour's wife. Um, so with between this group and these two people these two um, groups of people the they sort of lived in the same area and I put that in the chat as well in, on Bonnie Bray Street and you can go to the house um, on Bonnie Bray Street where this happened. Um, and, um, and so when people started being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, many people would come to this house to experience the Holy Ghost, um, in the same way. And they had so many people there that they say that the porch in front of the house just fell off of its foundation um, because so many people were there and the police were always um, asked to come and intervene because people would just fill the streets. And so that that is why they ended up going downtown and moving um, moving this, this revival um, to where they could be there um, in person, having this experience from near and far um, and pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so that's, they, they ended up moving to the facility that could really couldn't house all of those people, but could accommodate them the best way that they could, that it could. Oh, you're Professor, muted. Professor Espinoza, can you elaborate a little bit on those, those events of that day? Sure. I mean, it's an interesting turn of events. So William J. Seymour was called out to Los Angeles to become a pastor at a, at a holiness church led by Julia Hutchins. She was the interim pastor. And when William J. Seymour started talking about being baptized with the Holy Spirit, she said, we're not having none of this. So she padlocked the front door. And he said, she basically said, we don't want you anymore. So Seymour had just a few cents in his pocket. He's a black man in Los Angeles in 1906 with no money and no place to go. So at that point, he turned to one of the, um, one of the congregants, Ed Lee, and Ed, Ed Lee felt sorry for him. So I said, why don't you come stay with me for a bit until you can raise some money to get back to Texas? Because Seymour had come recently from Texas, where he attended Charles Parham's Bible School. And basically, when he was uh, with Ed Lee, he said, look, why don't we start a prayer meeting for revival? Let's do a 10 day prayer meeting. Let's pray for the Holy Spirit to fall. And Ed Lee wasn't quite sure to trust him or not, but he, he decided to step out in faith and he did. And they started this prayer meeting and a couple days into the prayer meeting, the fire fell. And by that, they meant that the Holy Spirit had fallen on some of the people at the prayer meeting. And they began to speak in unknown tongues and Ed Lee was one of them. And when Ed Lee began to speak in tongues, other people started praying to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as is talked about in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 4. It says, and when they were in the upper room, the, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and they began to speak in other tongues on the day of Pentecost, thus the name Pentecostal or Pentecostal movement. So that's what happened, and that began to attract a lot of attention. Ed Lee's received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he's speaking in tongues. And then Jenny Evans Moore speaking in tongues. 
William J. Seymour received the baptism of the Holy Spirit after other people received it on April 12th. He, he, he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And here's what's interesting about it. He was already talking about speaking in tongues before he himself had done it. But he believed in it. And one night, he got, up, he got on the altar, the makeshift altar in the Bonnie Bray house. And he was praying next to a white man. And they both received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time. And they both began to speak in tongues, black and white. And that's how the movement began. And from there, it moved over to Azusa Street, where the first supernatural event took place with a Mexican-American. But I can tell you that later. If you have time. We'll definitely talk about it. And just want to talk a little bit more about that original event that you referred to. There are plenty of people watching and who will watch in the future who are not in this faith, who are certainly not Pentecostal. Talk about the Pentecost in the New Testament book of Acts, because it's the centrality of this uh, denomination. Professor Campbell, would you like to, to talk about this? Oh, I would. <laughs> well, I would, but I was waiting for you because I think you probably have a better, sure. you know, <laughs> as a professor of religion. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to do this. Yes. So in the book of Acts, okay, so after Jesus died, according to the Christian tradition, he rose from the dead. He said, wait to receive the Holy Spirit. So they went to a place called the Upper Room in Jerusalem, and they were praying to receive the Holy Spirit. They had Jews from all over the world. They spoke multiple languages. And they had people that were not Jewish as well there as well. And they were all praying to receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised them that the Comforter will come. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit leads and guides Christians into living a holy and virtuous life. And so when they were praying in that room, a lot of people, some people say over 120 people, were praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fell, and they began to speak in other tongues. Now, what is a tongue? There's basically two different ways to understand this in the book of Acts. There's xenolalia, X-E-N-O-L-A-L-I-A, xenolalia, which is the ability to speak a language that's a human language that you've never studied before. The second type of a tongue is glossolalia. And glossolalia is a language known only to God. It kind of sounds like gibberish to an outsider. It's like tumina tumina tumikuri. And it has, there, there's no, there's no syntax or vocabulary to it. It's, it sounds like, you know, moanings and groanings. Um, it's distinctive to every individual person. It's like a personality. And so these two types of tongues are both referred to in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter two, verse four, they use the word xenolalia, which means that the Holy Spirit gave the apostles and the followers of Jesus the ability to speak another language they had never studied. Now, why did he do that? He did that so they could go become missionaries in those countries. So the, xenolalia is referred to as a missionary tongue. The purpose of giving you that tongue is so you can go become a missionary to people who, who speak, you know, um, Arabic, or people who speak Swahili, or people who speak Bengali, or people who speak Chinese. Back then it would have been different languages, but you see the point, that God gave you a special language so you could missionize them and, and share, your, share the Christian faith. The other thing I should say about Pentecostalism is that it teaches that every single Christian is given a spiritual gift. Those spiritual gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. They're the gift of helps, of pastoring, of evangelism, of service, of prophecy, of healing. People are given different gifts, not for your own personal edification. The purpose of the gifts is to build up the body of believers and to serve other people. And Seymour made this very clear. The purpose of tongues is not just for your own gratification. The purpose of the spiritual gifts is to empower everybody in the community. One of the remarkable things is the um, Azusa Street group published a paper, a newspaper. And um, some of the things that I've read and that both of you have, have analyzed 
is that when people began speaking in tongues and speaking foreign languages, there's actually documentation that people were actually speaking foreign languages like Russian, for instance. Yes, there were uh, claims throughout the newspaper. I've got a copy behind mm -hmm. me somewhere here. <laughs> All of the uh, copies of the copies, so to speak, that there reportedly was documentation with the native speakers that they were speaking their tongue. And the person said, where did you learn to speak my language? And they said, what are you talking about? I was just speaking in tongues. They said, no, you're speaking in Russian. Or no, you're speaking in, you're speaking in Spanish. Or no, you're speaking in you know, another language that they themselves spoke. Over 20 nationalities came to the revival. People who spoke Chinese, people who spoke Spanish, people who spoke Arabic. So it attracted a lot of immigrants because LA, as you know, to this day is an immigrant city. We have a lot of immigrants and there are a lot of immigrants at this revival. So people who are native speakers confirmed to those in attendance that the language that some of these individuals were speaking was in fact their own. And that was people at, at, uh, people at the revival said it was one of the greatest miracles. There's been efforts to try to document this. It's really hard to do that because it was largely based on testimonials of native speakers, but they did report this in their apostolic faith newspaper. 13 issues were issued from 1906 to 1908, and they're, they're available to, to read and to review. Yes, it's wonderful that there's an archive. I always plug the role of archives and understanding history and understanding our present day. And we're gonna talk a little bit more um, in a minute about the, the characteristic of Los Angeles and why this became a habitat for this movement. But I'd like to ask both of you, what do you have to say about the role that the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906 played in the Azusa Street Revival? Uh, can you talk about how it influenced the movement, whether it influenced the movement? Did it lend an apocalyptic tone? It was a huge destructive event that made world news that uh, caused many fires and, um, and happened during that week, uh, the, we, in the, just a few days after really, uh, the beginning of the, of the Azusa Street Revival. Yeah, um, well, I look at it in, in several ways. Um, so on the one hand, you've got this huge catastrophic event that is occurring, you know, at the beginning of a new millennial um, millennium, right? So you have like a millennialist um, sort of um, take on it. Um, and then, you know, so every new millennial, um, we believe people believe that the world is going to end. Um, and so, so there's, there's the sort of, okay, this is a sign that the world is ending or that God is, um, is judging, right? That there, that judgment has come and things like that. So I, I, I kind of look at it in that in, in that respect, on the one hand, um, and um, travelers, um, people who visited the Azusa Street Revival and led the Azusa Street Revival at certain points, um, uh, uh, Frank Bar Bartleman, Bart am I saying that right, Bartleman, <laughs> was one of those, thank you, was one of those who really saw this earthquake as a sign and a symbol um, for people to sort of get get right with God and, and those kinds of things. So it, it does sort of, um, um, you know, kind of spiritually do something for, for people. Um, at the same time, I look at it as a way that also, um, um, encouraged or pushed, uh, like a push factor of migrants out of San Francisco, not just black migrants, but all kinds of migrants from all backgrounds. Dr. Espinoza has talked about, um, you know, LA being this diverse city, a city of immigrants and stuff like that. And these are people, you know, some of these people would have probably gone to San Francisco at that time, if not for the earthquake, um, who end up coming to Los Angeles during that time. So I also look at it um, as 
um, the who's making up, you know, um, the city who's coming to the city and why doesn't this happen in San Francisco as, as opposed to um, Los Angeles. And so they're, they're, those are the sort of practical um, human, I think, ways that I look at it. Um, but I know, and Dr. Espinoza uh, may want to add, I'm, I'm not sure, or elaborate on the spiritual side of that, because it is, it, it was a big thing. And it also, it also proved to people that, you know, um, God was, God was watching. I mean, we, people say all the time, you better get right <laughs> with God, you know, get right now and, and things like that. So, um, so I, I, but I really try to focus on what then, what, you know, how Los Angeles becomes um, a more ideal place for this to occur. But I also think that Los Angeles didn't have, I don't think I know, Los Angeles didn't have the same sort of racial problems um, as San Francisco, Oakland, Sacramento, places where there were larger populations of Black people. Um, and Los Angeles had, um, you know, both cities, um, San Francisco and Los Angeles had huge mixes, as we said, of, of people from different ethnic and racial backgrounds. But the way that, you know, um, people interacted with one another was very different here in Los Angeles than it was in, in Northern California. Um, and so, so that, I mean, one example, we talk about Seymour and, um, and Edward Lee and, and Edward Lee was not a, um, he was a white man. He wasn't, he wasn't black. He wasn't a person of color, um, you know, necessarily he was, he was a white immigrant. Um, and so I think that, you know, that also says something about the ways in which people interacted on a personal level that could make something like Azusa Street happen here as opposed to other parts of the country. Yeah, I would simply just add that um, Los Angeles in 1906 wasn't a big city. You know, the, the city really doesn't take off in population until the 20s and 30s. It was not seen as a backwater, but it wasn't a prominent city like we view it today. San Francisco was the place to go in California for any number of reasons. And so Los Angeles is a fitting place. It was a place on the borders and margins of society that was beginning to grow and beginning to become a global port city. Um, and so, you know, for this event to take place there is strategic because people are, are moving into a new place. When you have new populations, all converge in one place. You have a greater openness to new ideas. So everybody's looking for a home. Everybody's looking for someone to connect with because they're leaving wherever they came from. For Seymour, it was the South. He grew up in Louisiana and spent some time on the, on the road along Harriet Tubman's Underground Railroad going up through the Midwest, but eventually going to Texas to find relatives lost during slavery days, and then on to California when he was invited to pastor a church, a holiness church there. So the earthquake itself was interpreted in different kinds of ways. For some, it was interpreted as a premonition that something great was going to happen, that God was going to do something great in this new century. For others, it was a foreboding of God's judgment. And for still others, it reminded them for the need to pray for revival and that people were reminded they were frail, that life is limited and fleeting, that they need to get right with God. So it was definitely talked about by Frank Bartleman. He had a, a whole track, a gospel track about the earthquake and about the need to become a Christian, to repent of your sins and, and, uh, no God, so to speak, as a result of that. So, very yes, they, they printed tens of thousands of copies mm -hmm. of that tract after the earthquake. And Bartleman and the Azusa Street Revival folks definitely had the point of view that this was a judgment. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that the earthquake and the preaching going on during the revival attracted new followers to the Azusa Street Revival. Let's talk about the background of the revival. Um, you mentioned already that uh, Reverend William Seymour came, he had a circuitous route getting to Los Angeles. Immediately, he came from Houston, 
which is a familiar migration story uh, for, for California, the African-American population that moved out of East Texas into, into California. There are many people, there might even be people in the audience this evening descended from those Texans that came uh, to the state. Um, but what was the background and what brought Reverend Seymour to Los Angeles? And, and talk a little bit about that, those holiness churches that did exist uh, before the Azusa Street Revival. Well, there were some um, grew, some small um, churches that really needed um, help um, with recruiting and just sort of, you know, overall um, getting people, you know, I mean, it's all recruiting, getting people interested in um, at least the holiness movement. And they were having some, um, you know, doctrinal differences, disagreements and things like that. And so um, Seymour was invited to come to kind of help these churches. He was um, a student of, of Parham as, um, um, or a follower, I should say, um, as Dr. Espinoza mentioned. And he um, was invited by a woman who was, um, who was like his maid. Um, and so, um, uh, so she comes and she asks, or she, excuse me, asks him to come to help these churches that are just having these divisions and, um, and talk to them. And so he gets to Los Angeles, but then as, as Dr. Espinosa mentioned, he's, he's preaching about speaking in tongues and he was clearly infatuated with, you know, Holy Spirit baptism. Um, and so, and, and, and so this was like the message that he was spreading. And then that only caused more problems between these small churches, but also um, with Julia Hutchins, who he um, is invited, you know, who he's trying to help um, and her church, and she locked him, you know, out as, as, as the professor mentioned. And, um, and so he now has to just go and do this like Bible study um, style and do it inside people's homes because he had lost his, um, you know, like his, um, well, I want to say he lost his pulpit, right? He, but he did, he, he lost like having a, um, a stage to um, spread these, these, um, this preaching. Um, and so, and it, and LA, you know, at the time there was a very small, not only was LA small, but there was a very, very small African-American community here. Um, and so LA County itself was, you know, under 3000 African-Americans and most of the African-Americans who were here were definitely not interested in, um, you know, pursuing a holiness or a charismatic, um, especially not a Pentecostal, um, you know, religion. Um, most of them were tied to those churches that um, were, were very much known in the black middle class circles, like the first AME church or a second Baptist church. And so, um, you know, you, if you were Seymour, you couldn't help but appeal to whoever you can appeal to, right? And, and open your tent as, as big and wide as possible, which um, helped and allowed for um, people from different backgrounds to be a part of this. I would simply add that the holiness movement was an offshoot of the Methodist church. They believed that you could live a holy life in this world now because Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. So if Jesus said it, that meant it was possible. And they thought that through living a, a holy sanctified life, and by sanctified, I mean um, carrying out good actions, following the 10 commandments, etc., you could live a, a pretty close to perfect life in your actions, in your thoughts, in your words, in your deeds. So Pentecostalism has always had a fairly strict ethical code. No smoking, no drinking, no drugs, no adultery, things like that. And so it's been pretty strict about that. And it's also been very strict about conversion. When you convert, 
you got to give your life 100% to Jesus Christ, not 90%, 98%, you know, a little bit here and there. And so that attracts people because it gives them a sense of purpose, hope, and meaning. It also provides boundaries, but it also could rub some people the wrong way. So it has a strong message that God can redeem even the most horrible of sinners and give you a fresh start by the power of God. Um, but it also asks of you that when you give your life to God, you need to try to follow it up by living for him, by living a sanctified life, by living like a saint. Um, not literally perfect. They don't believe that's possible, but to try to do what's right. And so the holiness people really stress being holy, living a holy life in a very practical way. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, middle class Black churches or working class. A lot. You, I, I think the mainstream churches still had a majority of working class people, but they're, they're, it's a, class factors are important and influence the Azusa Street Revival. And I'd like to talk about that and uh, uh, who was attracted. Um, and also uh, I would say there's, there was a kind of egalitarianism um, in the church and even in the doctrine and, a lack of the kind of hierarchical uh, practices that that you see elsewhere, and maybe you could talk about those kind of class issues and egalitarianism in the movement. Yeah. So um, first of all, I mean the the majority of people who come to the movement are um, are working class people, and the 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 at the the examples of a Holy Ghost baptism that people are seeing, um, people passers by on the street, um, don't see this as, um, you know, this is clearly not highbrow if they were trying to be cultured, if they were trying, none of that was part of um, Azusa Street, right? Um, and Seymour really believed that the Holy Ghost could, um, could equip anyone to preach could equip anyone to um, so these spiritual gifts that um, Professor Espinoza was saying earlier um, could go to anybody. It didn't matter who they were, and everybody didn't have to receive the same spiritual gifts. So, um, Susan, may you may prophesy, prophesy, prophesy. Excuse me, I might have the gift of healing. Um, you know. Uh, Professor Espinoza might have the gift of, um, what would be your gift, Professor Espinoza? <laughs> service, service. Service. That's very good. Good answer. Um, and so different people would, you know, so, so different people would be equipped to do different things, which would then, um, you know, help the movement spread. It didn't matter who was in the in the uh, pul who was in the I don't want to say pulpit, but who was there preaching because they all had a me you had a message from God if you were there, and um, and and so he really fully believed that God was not a discriminator in those ways for color um, or gender or any of those things, and and only through the movement of God was the work of Pentecostalism going to be able. Um, to be done, which um, some people thought was fantastic and really, really appreciated. And I want to also say, nor did you have to speak English as a first language, right? And so, um, so this also helped to, you know, just appeal to many, many different, different people. Um, so, so there's, there's kind of how he practiced the, um, or put egalitarianism into practice in the, in the revival. But on the other hand, um, because it, the buildings were crowded, because they were making these noises, they, people would, would report hearing these crazy noises um, all throughout the night. Um, some at some point, um, especially in summertime, it was hot and you had these crowded buildings. And so so people felt like they, um, you know, there was a, a bad odor coming from them, that people were not clean, like all kinds of, of things that go against sort of what some of these other people who are trying to, even if they were working class, were trying to sort of portray themselves as above working class people, um, you know, 
um, so those, those groups, those certain people sort of just, just tried to like either brush it under the rug or get rid of it altogether. And when I say sweep it under the rug, I mean, they just tried to ignore that it was happening, but it kept growing and growing and growing. And there was opposition. I mean, mm -hmm. people called the police on the meetings. There were certainly white people in the city of Los Angeles who were just outraged at these interracial mixing, it, 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 that's right. Um, and and per, perhaps uh, Dr. Espinosa, you could talk a little, a little bit more. There were there was controversy associated with the Azusa Street revival. Yeah, there was a lot of emphasis on equality. Seymour said, "God is no respecter of persons," and by that he meant God doesn't care if you're rich, white, black what your job is, you know, how much money you have, how many kids you have or don't have, how big your house is or how nice, how nice your horse or car is. In 1906, they were transitioning from horses to cars, okay, and carriages. I mean, he doesn't care. So if God doesn't care, we don't care. That was kind of their attitude. Anybody can come in just as you are because we all need a doctor at some point in our life, whether rich or poor, right, tall or short. So Seymour had this, this kind of a, approach that said, look, everybody's equal at the foot of the cross. Everybody, no matter where you come from, we all have to kneel. We all have to confess Jesus Christ is Lord, and God will heal anybody, even the most horrible of sinners. So that also included not only welcoming men from different racial ethnic backgrounds, but also welcoming women. You know, in 1906, it was inappropriate for men and women to be touching each other in a public setting, let alone a church, right? It just wasn't part of the proper decorum of the period. And at Azusa Street, one of the most scandalous accusations of all was, you know, men of color praying for white women. As one writer put, white women of wealth and culture. Azusa attracted people not only from working class backgrounds, but also like women like Florence Crawford, who was the director of the Women's Christian Temperance Union a very important woman in Los Angeles. She was a white woman of, of, of wealth and means. She attended. So it attracted people from all racial and ethnic and class backgrounds, but it tended to focus on the working class and the poor because when they went out into the streets, that's who they found. So churches evangelized in their neighborhoods. And so that's what we see. So there is this focus on anybody's welcome. They even published articles written by women, testimonies written by women. Uh, Florence Crawford actually was Seymour's state director who would go up and down the state to check out all the missions to make sure they were doing well. They would have to report to her, representing him. She was on the ordination committee. Florence Crawford was a person of means and considerable strength. Uh, Clara Lum was a, also a white woman. She ran the newspaper along with um, Jenny Moore and others. They all contributed various articles and testimonies. We also see that Abundio Lopez uh, offered his testimony, which they published in Spanish and English. It's one of the very few instances where you have a movement led by Blacks or African-Americans publishing materials in Spanish. So that's a remarkable testimony. It's in, it's in English and Spanish. They also uh, publish brief testimonies or statements of, by other Mexican-Americans who also attended. And similar comments can be made about other ethnic groups at Azusa. So there was this egalitarian principle that God respects people with sincere hearts who are really seeking after him. And if you don't have much, it's okay because God will make up the difference. He may not make you rich, but it'll make you happy. The statement about women like Florence Crawford is very powerful because this was a time, um, especially in the um, temperance movement and in the suffrage movement where white women, especially white women of privilege, uh, racial segregation was something they were not willing to give up. They refused to work with black women in their organizations and they had very strong pronouncements about why they wouldn't do it. So, just to give people a sense, because history, thing, you know, things, things in the past uh, uh, definitely had a, had a certain implication. And for those women to be in the movement, 
but also very highly visible as leaders of the movement was um, really a huge departure from the social and political behavior of most white women uh, activists at the time, including in, Ca in California. Um, and this multiracial nature of the movement, um, Professor Campbell, you wrote that the Pentecostal movement that this uh, represented had the potential for bringing about a revolution in the nature of interracial and intergroup relations in the United States. And how, how so? Well, this is, you know, a rare instance where you see people from all different backgrounds, but, you know, particularly racially, racial and ethnic backgrounds coming together for one common cause. Um, and every, not every, I mean, there were a few, I will say power hungry people, <laughs> you know, power grabbers and things like that. But the people who were there for this were pure and completely dedicated to, um, you know, spreading um, God's love and God's word across the world and, and doing good things for people. And, and so for me, it just seemed like this revival was, um, you know, the first real crack at, um, it, 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 I guess, in, in, in sort of looking at how well um, coalition building, <laughs> for lack of a better, you know, way of describing it, could go that you could bring in every everybody from you know any kind of background and as long as everybody was focused on the common goal and not focused on themselves um, that you could achieve so much and indeed you know the azusa street revival does come you know it, it does give us a lot of things we have a lot of churches um you know pentecostal churches there are there are certainly ups and downs and breaks in that but I mean it did it did spark um you know a whole new um um you know way of worshiping for a lot of people and it's you know one of the largest um you know of of the um, religious groups today and it and worldwide and so it is embracing it is encompassing it you know um even though churches are still segregated today and, and all of that kind of stuff, um, Pentecostalism has few, far fewer, I would say, doctrinal divides than in some of the other churches, um, some of the other groups. And I think that, you know, they really could touch a lot of lives without, without being you know, sort of, I'm, I'm trying not to, I'm trying not to offend anyone here. I'm trying, when I'm thinking about the words that I'm, I'm trying to choose my words carefully. Um, and that is just to sort of do the work of God without worrying about um, what it's going to get you in the end, aside from into heaven. But there, there was and there is that racial divide. There is such a thing as Black Pentecostalism, and there is such a thing as White Pentecostalism. And it, it's to me, it's kind of symbolized from the, in the birth of the movement when William Seymour was in Kansas, I believe it's Kansas, when Charles he wanted Parham. to study with Charles Parham, who's some people consider another one of the founders. And Charles Parham, a white man, would not allow him into the classroom. He had to stand in the hallway uh, to yeah. listen to, to his lessons. This was before Seymour came to Los Angeles. Um, yeah. But yeah, and oh, go ahead, Susan. No, I'm you, sorry. you, you go ahead. Oh no, I was going to say it start. You know, it, it starts that way. That didn't affect Seymour. But look at. I, I mean, we can look at sort of where Pentecostalism went under Charles Parham, and we can look at where Pentecostal went with Seymour's leadership. And we can see now, I mean, obviously nobody could see it back then. We could see now um, who made the greater impact 
I mean, we can argue, I guess, um, from a theological standpoint, if it was just the sort of speaking in tongues was the thing, or whether there was an actual social movement that came out of it. Um, and, and that's what we get from William Seymour and the Azusa Street Revival. And, and, you know, this is a really difficult time in U.S. history because this is the lowest point, um, the nadir for African-Americans. Um, lynchings are at an all-time high um, when this, you know, movement begins. Um, here in the West, um, people of Mexican descent are, are being lynched all over the country in large numbers, um, you know. So, I mean, this is a very violent, racially charged time that this movement is born out of. And, and you know, for me, I think that is what's remarkable is that this movement still grew it's still, you know, um, people still flock to it. And the reason why people are coming to it is because they are hearing directly from God. I don't know you, I've never met you, but I meet you on the street and I can speak to you in your native language, in your tongue. I've never, I've never learned your tongue. I could call you by your name and tell you that God has a message for you. And well, that is... That's that alone is what was re, I mean, those kinds of, of interactions are what was reported in the newspaper. And so that and those messages were being spread all over the world and churches were were popping up because people were, you know, convinced and convicted that God was really watching them and speaking to them. Well, I, I would just say that from the time of the Protestant reformation that each splintering at the at its heart is an attempt to have that intimate experience um to sure. get away from from be, you know having someone in between you and the force mm -hmm. and um certainly uh pentecostal the pentecostal movement in los angeles represent represented that we're gonna, I, I wanna uh, wrap up with a few remarks so that we can take uh, questions from our wonderful audience, but I, I wanna uh, just kind of um, uh, bring things to a close and ask you to let us know how long that revival lasted. And, um, but then, I mean, the, the revival ended in Los Angeles, but a movement was trans planted around the world. And maybe we could end by talking about that, the, the decline of a movement, but also the birth of a, of, a, of a new religion. So there are a lot of reasons for the decline. Um, despite the harmony that existed at Azusa Street for quite some time, uh, little differences began to emerge. Um, one of the first is when William J. Seymour married Ginny Evans Moore. Clara Lum, a white uh, stenographer and person around the newspaper, according to Charles Mason, said that um, she had feelings for Seymour. And Jenny, so you have both Jenny, Jenny Lum, Clara Lum, excuse me, and Jenny Seymour, both, you know, caring about Seymour, wanting to possibly have a future with him. And Seymour chose Jenny Evans Moore. And, uh, you know, and according to some, at least according to Mason, this is based on an interview that Mason did, Charles Mason. Um, with uh, Seymour and others, uh, according to him, Seymour told him that Jenny was upset, excuse me, um, Clara Lum was upset after he decided to marry Jenny Evans Moore. And she was so upset that she took the newspaper with her, went to, to Oregon, where Florence Crawford had moved to start a new satellite church in Eugene, Oregon, and started restarted the paper there under her, uh, reg, uh, under her guidance. And so when she took the newspaper, she took away Seymour's platform to reach people around the world. By that time, they had published 405,000 copies of the Apostolic Faith newspaper. And they were going all over the world. People in South Africa were reading them. People in India were reading them. People all over the world were reading these papers, even before Azusa missionaries went there. So Seymour's theological DNA 
was being exported globally through missionaries, through other newspapers that would carry some of the articles, et cetera. And so when, when Clara Lum took that newspaper, that was a very significant step because it took away Seymour's ability to reach people across the country and also across the nation. He no longer had this massive platform, this technological platform, an advantage. Second, there were some power dynamics where some of the white leaders tried to take over the mission. And, um, you know, for different reasons, we could talk about it during the Q&A, but they felt that Seymour needed to share power or he needed to step aside and let them become the, the key leaders. And this led to division. And for that reason, some of the leaders left and began starting a rival mission called the Upper Room and other missions in the area that in time began to compete with Azusa Street. So this fragmentation theory that I've argued or component of Azusa Street is one of the strengths of the movement, right? People feel called, they feel, feel empowered and Seymour would give money to people. They take an offering right there on the spot. They'd send people to India, to Sweden, to the Middle East, to China, to Africa, to Liberia, to South Africa. But the downside to it is people also feel called to start their own movements, even in the city of Los Angeles. And so that was one of the um, unfortunate developments in the movement is that people began to create missions that began to compete with Seymour's mission. So those are some of the reasons why um, Seymour's contributions began to decline. And by 1911, the, the, the revival formally ends around 1909, in the year of 1909. It still lingers on aspects of it through 1911, 1912. And then after that, the mission still is in full operation until 1932. But um, it's a much smaller group. It's really reduced back to about 40 people, the original interracial band of black men and, 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 and women and white men and white women um, praying for revival and doing their spiritual things. But yeah, so those are some of the reasons for the decline. Um, its impact though is significant. One little story, you know, Martin Luther King's last speech was at Mason, Mason uh, Tabernacle and that's Charles Mason's church. And it's ironic, you know, that that here you have Martin Luther King giving a speech from a pulpit influenced by Seymour. He gives his famous, I've been in the mountaintop speech there. It's a powerful speech. And it, I think it ties nicely and eloquently to what Seymour was trying to do, you know, more than half a century earlier to create a colorblind society and a colorblind church. Well, that's a wonderful way to end this segment. Um, I'm looking at some of the Q and A and um, someone is asking if copies of the newspaper are available online. Most copies should be available online. There are probably various places to download them. I also have copies of the newspaper excerpts in my book. The book, half of the book is primary sources. Anything that Seymour ever wrote is in the book. Testimonies for Seymour, even some of his critics are also in the book. Also a Seymour's minister's manual, which he published. So. But there are copies you can buy at the um, Assemblies of God Flower Pentecostal Heritage Center. They have copies there. The Apostolic Faith um, Headquarters in Portland, Oregon, I believe it is, has copies there. And I think there are copies online just through public domain. Yeah. And I will just say that um, Professor Espinoza's book is an amazing source. So I would start there. <laughs> I think it's the source and that's why we're so pleased to have him and you here. Um, let's see, someone asked, how did the two denominations, the Assemblies of God and the Church of God in Christ, this, is, this goes back to the black Pentecostalism, white Pentecostalism, description, how did they come out of the Azusa movement? And also ask, what about Amy Semple McPherson? So um, the Church of God in Christ is the, was, is the first um, official Pentecostal um, church that comes out of the Azusa Street Revival. And um, um, Charles Mason is one of was one of the founders of 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 that um, church, and that was um, established in 1907. The Assemblies of God was um, 
is, is very similar to the Church of God in Christ. However, um, the ministers of the Assemblies of God did not want to be ordained by a Black man. So um, they formed their own church called the Assemblies of God. And I want to say that was 1911 is when that occurred. Am I wrong about that, Professor? It's uh, 1914. Thank you, 1914. Um, and so, um, so, so the, the doctrines I believe are similar. I'm gonna stop because I think, I think Professor Espinoza probably knows more um, from a theological standpoint, but, um, but the doctrines were, were very similar. Um, it's just that one group didn't want another group to have uh, control over who could be a minister and who couldn't. Yeah. I mean, uh, Dr. Campbell is absolutely right. Um, Charles Mason came out from Tennessee and he actually attended the Azusa Street Revival and had a really radical transformation there and took that Pentecostal movement back to the Deep South. Well, Tennessee and then the Deep South after that. Also Gaston Barnabas Cashwell came from North Carolina. He was actually someone who harbored white supremacist attitudes and said that his white supremacy was crucified at the altar at Azusa Street. And he went back to South Carolina, uh, North Carolina, Dunn, North Carolina, and began preaching Seymour's message of racial equality. He was so poor, he didn't have any money for clothes. Seymour raised enough money at the revival to buy him a new coat, a new suit. He went back and he created the, basically the Azusa, the Azusa of the South for a number of years and converted countless white Americans and blacks as well to Pentecostalism. And so uh, that's where that movement takes place. In 1913, Mason was, um, had in his ranks both black and white Pentecostal leaders. Some of the Southern Pentecostal leaders felt that they should have an organization uh, primarily for whites. They wouldn't probably say that in official documents, but that's functionally what it was. And so they created in Hot Springs, Arkansas, the General Council of the Assemblies of God. Um, and uh, for a period of time, actually, the Assemblies of God would, would put in the ministers, because they still had black ministers, the Assemblies of God, but they would put in notation after their name, colored, because you couldn't tell by their name if they're white. So if you lived in a segregated town, whether it was because you were, it was whether or not you harbored white supremacist views or not, people in your congregation might. So they would note the racial identity of the person in the minister's uh, book with listed all the clergy so you could figure out who to invite. But they, they repented of that um, act in the Memphis Miracle a few years back in other ceremonies. But uh, basically the movement fragmented along racial and ethnic lines in part because of their primary constituencies, in part because of the hardening of racism. The, in the United States. Uh, exactly. Yeah, in the United States. The, the Ku Klux Klan doesn't reach, its ep doesn't reach its high point until 1925. So the Assemblies of God is created in 1914. So there's a lot of pressure to, to, to uh, restrict what you do. But let me say this, both in the Church of God in Christ and Mason's denomination, and also in the Assemblies of God, you have people from other racial ethnic groups as well, pretty much throughout the entire history, but they were not very large in number. That's changed a lot today. They're very different movements. Mm -hmm. the, the little addition about Amy Semple McPherson in the question reminds me that Los Angeles was a place of, re of religious and spiritual experimentation, that it was where the Fellowship of Reconciliation, where the science of mind, Amy Semple McPherson, Buddhism had roots here early in the history of the city and I think helped make the city more um, a, a, a place, uh, more welcoming, more open to something like the Azusa Street uh, revival. And maybe since we did have the question, somebody uh, could address a little bit about Amy Semple McPherson. Where did she fall into this Azusa Street revival uh, uh, context? Well, would you, would you like to take that or would you like me to take that? Okay, so Amy Simpson McPherson came out of a Salvation Army background from 
you know, in Canada. And she uh, perceived the Pentecostal movement when she was a young woman. She wanted to be a missionary in China. Her husband died and there were missionaries overseas. She came back and she felt called to start a, a ministry in Southern California. She actually knew Seymour and Seymour actually attended some of her church services, but she didn't acknowledge him from, from the pulpit though, unfortunately. But they didn't know each other. They didn't know of each other, at least. And she really helped to uh, build the profile of the Pentecost movement in Los Angeles through her um, Angeles Temple, which seated 5,000 people, which at that time was one of the mega mega church. Mega church. I mean, <laughs> actors from Hollywood would go there. Charlie Chaplin, uh, Anthony Quinn. He was actually converted in, in a Latino Pentecostal church, and then Anthony Quinn started going to McPherson's church afterwards because McPherson and a, a Mexican-American um, evangelist I'm writing a book about actually held joint services together. So McPherson was open to working with people from a different racial ethnic groups, but uh, she did have a strong personality, just put it that way. But she was very open and she was very evangelistic and very effective and really helped to build a profile there uh, in Los Angeles. I think Anthony Quinn actually grew up in that neighborhood. Um, too, near Echo Park Lake. He, did. Um, yeah. he, he actually went to um, a Latin American Council of Christian Churches church when he was a boy. He played, I, I think, the saxophone, and he was in the, this uh, Mexican-American ch Pentecostal church's worship team for a while. And then when McPherson and this Mexican evangelist named uh, Francisco Olazabo had joint services in, in Watts and Boyle Heights, um, he heard her preach, and he spoke English, too his father was was uh, Irish, his mother was Mexican, and he started attending. And his mother was healed, actually, at a Pentecostal service, I think, in this Mexican church. And so Anthony Quinn was pretty involved in that church for a number of years as, a, I think, a young man, high school and or college age. And then he, and then he went into the movie industry. Okay. We should movie. probably mention, for there are probably people in the audience who don't know who Anthony Quinn is. So Anthony Quinn was a very famous uh, actor. And a movie star, he played in a number of films, uh, um, Zorba, Zorba the Greek, Zorba the Greek uh, <laughs> a film about, uh, called Barabbas, about the person that was not crucified. It's actually a very powerful film. It's people have forgotten about it and just a number of films. A number of films in, in case, very famous actor, A-list Hollywood actor. Um, someone asked, where do we find Pastor Seymour's grave? So Pastor, I'm sorry, good morning. So Pastor Seymour is buried in Evergreen Cemetery in East LA, along with Amy Sultan McPherson. You can find her grave there, and also Francisco Olasano. All of their graves are located in that one cemetery, and others as well. So, yeah. I was just, I was going to say that as well as um, you will find other. Um, early black pioneers for Los Angeles buried there as well. Yes, it's, it's, if you're interested in history, well, many graveyards are, are good places to, to know about, but it's in its extraordinary, the historical figures that are, that are in, these, in these graves. Um, someone asked, how did Reverend Seymour get whitewashed out of Pentecostal history? Well, uh, Marnie, did you want to take that? <laughs> well, from a historiographic standpoint, um, when uh, people were writing the history, the debate was, was the initial debate was about sort of when does Pentecostalism um, in America begin? Um, and, and so like, who is the father of the doctrine of, of, of tongues, right? Who makes, who popularizes speaking in tongues? And so that's why um, there's a lot of focus on Parham um, as opposed to Seymour, being that Seymour was again, semi-student. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I wanna call him a, a student of Parham's um, given the way that he was treated, but, um, but, so learning about tongues and all of that comes from someone else, but Seymour is the one that made, made it happen. So that, that was the initial debate. And that seems to be what a lot of the, um, 
the research shows that people were more sort of focused on that as opposed to um, the cultural, socio-political and socio-economic implications of the Azusa Street Revival itself. And, and if you want more information on that, in, in the introduction to my book, I survey 100 years of historiography on Seymour, how he was interpreted. Basically, the different interpretations in a nutshell are, <clears throat> God was the founder of the movement, there was no human leader, Parham was the founder of the movement, and Seymour was his humble, his humble protege. Um, the other theories that have been postulated throughout Pentecostal history is that Parham and Seymour were co-founders, uh, that's relatively recent, post-1970s, Vincent Sinan. More recently, uh, people have argued that there are multiple origins of global Pentecostals and that God poured out his spirit globally at the same time, which is a theological explanation. Um, I've argued in the book that, that Seymour was a, an actual contributor to the growth of global Pentecostalism between 1906 and 1911. Once he lost that newspaper and then his platform shortly thereafter, his influence tapered off, and in part it tapered off because there was a struggle between Seymour and Parham himself. Uh, Parham begins to criticize Seymour's mission, and he uses a lot of racial derogatory language, which is all in the book, in the primary source section at the back, um, to describe Seymour and the mission in highly racialized terms and tries to, to diminish it. But Parham's personality uh, cost him his own leadership. People thought he was too acerbic, he was too um, denunciatory, and he was also accused of some, some uh, sexual impropriety and misgivings. So his star began to fade pretty quickly after 1906, and he was largely a regional leader in the Midwest, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Texas, that Missouri, that region, is where his influence largely remained through most of his life. I want to add one more thing that's really important. You know, it's pretty popular to this day to say that Seymour simply popularized Parham's belief. But actually, Seymour promoted a much more orthodox view of Pentecostalism that was consistent with Protestant orthodoxy. Parham taught annihilationism, that there's, that there's no such thing as hell. He taught eighth day creationism. He taught that miscegenation caused Noah's flood. Um, he, he promoted a lot of a kind of universalism. He promoted a lot of beliefs that were not considered orthodox or orthodox Protestants or Catholics. Seymour kept the movement orthodox. And Seymour was very clear to criticize Parham after Parham's break with Seymour in, in October of 1906. And I argue in the book that Seymour created his own uh, divinely led inspired movement that uh, was quite different from Parham's in a number of areas, theologically, racial ethnically, because Parham um, affirmed white supremacy in different ways, and that Seymour wasn't gonna have any of that. So Seymour did go to Parham's Bible school for about six weeks or so. There's a big debate about the level of influence. He did, Parham did influence Seymour's belief that speaking in tongues was the initial manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Later, Seymour modifies that view to say that Speaking in tongues is a manifestation of the, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it's one of many. So he still held to it. He never changed his view. But Parham said that if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you must speak with a human language. Seymour said it could be a human language, xenolalia, or a divine language known between only you and God, glossolalia. You know, we're going to be wrapping up. I really um, am so grateful, and I want to thank Professor Marnie Campbell at Loyola Marymount University and Professor Gaston Espinoza at Claremont McKenna College for being our guests tonight and for bringing this really rich discussion uh, to us about this extraordinary movement that is still having an impact on our lives and our world uh, today. I want to thank the audience for joining us. Um, let me say that the California African American Museum is a, an institution whose mission it is to gather and preserve and interpret California's African American history. And um, we're happy to do that through our exhibitions, through our collections, and through our 
programs. Tonight's program was inspired by an exhibition at currently at CAM, Enunciated Life, that was organized by my colleague, Taylor Aldridge, who opened tonight's program. And I want to remind everybody that CAM is open and uh, you can come and visit this exhibit. We're always free to the public. You have to reserve tickets because of the rules of the pandemic. Um, but we'd like to invite you to come and see Enunciated Life, which will be running um, through August 15th, as well as the other exhibitions that are available in our galleries right now. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to say thank you to everyone, to my um, colleagues at CAM, to Alexandra Mitchell, our, our program manager, and to our audience. So good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.